committee, the first meeting of the 2017-2018 school year. Um, tonight we will be discussing the LINCS program in the high schools as well as going through um, having a discussion regarding which classes are running and not running and of course update um, for the district. If we could go around the table and introduce ourselves, so everyone knows who's here. I am Kyle McKessie representing school board. I am Susan McCarthy, Principal of Council Rock North and the Supervisor of the Evans Program. And I'm Margaret Jung, a student at Sierra North. Kathleen Mulholland, School Board. Garrett Papazian. Matt Fredrickson, IT Director. Sue Elliott, Assistant Superintendent. Barry Desco, Director of K-12 Education. Ed Tate, School Board. Andy Watt, School Board. We also have Denise Brooks attending remotely for a short period of time. She's traveling from work. Mr. Violet is traveling from work. Mr. Grubb is traveling from work. And Mrs. Thomas expects to be here within 20 minutes, also traveling from work. And Mr. Thorne has back to school now. All right, so we have two uh, topics this evening. First, we're going to talk about the um, high school course update for this year, and then our second topic will be our links update. So I'm going to um, very briefly go over the uh, courses uh, at the high school, those that are not running this year, courses that we are shuttling um, students for, uh, between North and South, and then also the combined courses where we have a couple um, courses where we're combining those courses together to be able to run them. So, you good? Oh, I'm good. <laughs> so, um, starting with English, you see that we have a couple courses in both North and South that are not running. Um, these are mostly all elective courses, obviously. Uh, you see there uh, a couple that are not running for both in North and South, so that's something that we'll, we'll take a look at the history of some of those courses and see how, you know, has there been a pattern of how long they've not been running? We need to look at possibly um, removing some courses from uh, our course offerings, um, especially if they're not running at both schools, is something that we would want to look at. Uh, so when we plan the courses that we're going to offer, and then we end up not offering it to enrollment, have we planned for teachers in these classes that then we find for some find something else to do? Because this is typically coming after. When does when, when actually the city get a relative to the budget? So this this conversation um, happens in late March, typically. Okay. So uh, Sue, myself, Dr. Frazier meet with the two high school principals and the two high school schedulers. Look at the enrollment number of various courses, determine which courses will and won't run. Uh, how many sections are necessary? In Barry, the, can you speak up a little bit, please? Certainly. So we meet uh, in, in March after students make their course selections. Uh, at that point in time, uh, Sue Elliott, myself, Dr. Frazier, we meet, and, and Chuck Lambert, we meet with uh, the two high school principals, the two high school scheduling administrators, uh, and look at the course enrollments, and at that point in time, make a decision about those courses that will run or should run the courses that would fit as shuttle courses, et cetera, and then determine the staffing needs at both high schools. Then the high school administrators go back, utilize that information, look at their current staffing, determine if there are either reductions or uh, need to add staff in particular areas. And sometimes there's some of each, even though overall staffing could remain the same in a high school, it could be a slight gain in one department and a slight loss in another department. So this is not this this is finalized before the budget. So what we're seeing today was decided there's no impact by the way in terms of extra work needed. Correct. Correct. Mr. Ryan right. makes those adjustments in the budget before okay. final approval. Thank you. All right, so um, again, continuing with some other courses, uh, world languages, we see uh, French and German one there, um, and then look at art, and you see we have some uh, sculpture courses that are both not running at, at the two um, high schools. And then you see there is a difference with at North, all the business courses are running, but at South, there are some courses that are not running. Um, 
Then here, family and consumer science, we have a, uh, a similar course across the two schools that is not running, and then a couple, uh, some differences there. And then again, health and PE at the north, all the courses are running, but at south, we've got one of the courses that is not running, due to all due to lack of enrollment. Uh, then in music, we see, uh, again, some, some similarities and some differences across the two high schools where we have some courses as well as with technology education, some courses in both that are not running, and then some differences um, in the two high schools with courses that are or aren't running due to lack of enrollment. So our shuttle courses, these are the courses where we have some students that are traveling either to north and south or to south and north for specific courses. So what you see there is the name of the course and how many students are shuttling. So for example, accelerated microbiology, we have two students going from north to south to take that course. Um, so you can see that you know, we don't have a lot of students shuttling, but we do have a few from each building that are shuttling. And, and of course, our largest is AP Chemistry. We have seven students who are shuttling for that. Most of our shuttle courses are happening first and second period or ninth period of the day for students. And then our combined courses, these are uh, courses where the teacher is teaching both of those courses uh, at the same class period and differentiating within the class period for the students. So you see there are a couple in English, uh, some world language courses, both at North and South, where we're combining the um, regular section or the academic level with the honors level of that same um, year of world language. Um, the exception there is with Latin, where we have Latin three and four together. Um, and the teachers uh, will differentiate for that. So long as we've been, excuse me, combining levels three and four for um, academic learners. For world languages, it, particularly in French and German, we, we've been combining for a couple of years um, to, to enable to have a, a, a section, a large enough section, so that we can continue to run that world language for the students that want to take that language for multiple years. So we want to give them that opportunity, uh, especially when you look at you know college recommendations and, and things. Most colleges you know recommend at least two years of a of a world language, uh, some require it as two, and, and you know, depending on what school you might be applying to, the, the recommended number of years and required years might change slightly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if a student starts out in eighth grade taking French or German, which 80% of our students are taking the world language as an eighth grader, we want to be able to continue to give them that opportunity to take the language they chose all the way through as many years as, as they want to in high school. I think it's a good idea. I just wonder if it's difficult to manage that combination of levels. Um, it can be challenging at times. I think that the teachers do a really good job of trying to differentiate activities, um, assignments a little bit for students, uh, you know, to, to make sure that they're able to, to learn what they need to learn. Um, they are the best they're very fortunate that yes. they are as interested as they are as they are in their commitment to the game. Yeah, it takes a willing teacher to make it work, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And we have a common textbook series that carries them yes. through, so that's been helpful too. Great. So and we, we allow our teachers to have input into what they feel will work best for them. Uh, for example, it's not a given that, that uh, the same courses would be combined or not in both high schools, right? uh, especially in the math center and thinking of um, grade four. Um, the numbers still have to be way they need to be, but they do have to put it into what they work best for them. So, so I saw there was mostly German and French. Yes. We've got some of the small numbers. I guess I asked the question because there were a lot of combined courses up there. Is it a function of the fact that we start late and we don't have a function? Function on either more languages or languages all the way through, or is it just a lot of shifts in Spanish for their kids walk away from some of these languages later in their secondary school? Well, when you look at even in eighth grade, the majority of our kids take Spanish as their as their language. So we have more students who are selecting Spanish as the world language they want to take starting in eighth grade. 
and just fewer numbers that select German French. And so sometimes when you get to level three and four, um, students will, will drop world language because they've met their college requirement. But, you know, especially after level three, they've met the two years they need to take for college, so they drop world language because there are other courses they want to take or, you know, various reasons um, that, that they decide. And so that also contributes to why we might be needing to combine some things together as well. Well, not, not all colleges have a two-year requirement, though. I mean, some, it depends on the college. So correct. if, you, if you're interested in a certain school, obviously you should check that yes. um, specifically. Um, but there was some talk last year of looking into uh, bringing back an exploratory program. Is, there, is that something that's being considered at all anymore? So we looked at that for the middle school. Um, and the, the challenge with that is the way the middle school schedule is structured and the, the humanities uh, block that the kids have that every six weeks they shift some courses and it, it can't fit into the schedule right now. There's just no way to fit exploratory world language into the middle school schedule in seventh grade to give kids the opportunity to. Wasn't there some discussion though about maybe some kids could didn't have to take reading in seventh grade? Um, that for the highest achieving, you know, if, if you were advanced, or proficient consistently or whatever, that there would be some consideration to look. Because to your question earlier, Andy, at back years ago when we had an exploratory program, you didn't see as many students choosing Spanish. So there was a, it was a more levelized uh, enrollment. I mean, Spanish was always the most popular, but you saw much higher enrollments in German and French when they were able to be exposed to it through an exploratory program, as opposed to just today's your day to sign up for a course, they get a little, you know, brief introduction by a staff member. Um, yeah, I think where the question was going ultimately was around is that the world gets smaller, meaning it's easier to get to all these other places. You know, are we missing on languages that kids are going to need you know, 12 years down the road to say today? But, but more so, kind of back to some of those emails that were bouncing around last week, our, our look at our language program in general. Mm -hmm. um, I know you guys are looking at that. Do you have an idea of when we might be able to see the output of what you're doing? I don't know. October. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay. There you go. Yes. I don't want to ask any more questions. Yeah, so um, that conversation continued with um, middle school principals, and there, there's really two uh, main factors that um, focused them on not implementing a uh, program. One was it would require giving something else up. In other words, when we shifted to a middle school program, they already reduced the minutes that students would have from a 55 minute class to a 44, 45 minute class because they had a period. So, there, so the day, each of the periods are too short to shorten them anymore to add a period. So they have to remove something. The second and probably the largest uh, factor in it is the difficulty in staffing a, uh, an exploratory program where you have, you're going to have to share staff because when you're running exploratory, all the all the teachers are not teaching all the subjects all the time. So what happens when that teacher is not teaching that subject in that school and going to two schools? So it's uh, relatively costly because you're going to get travel periods for multiple teachers to shift between um, each of the schools. <coughs> so that, that was the, the thinking, the difficulty in scheduling that. Um, the more teachers we share, the harder it's been for the middle schools to staff and share teachers. When they're in the building by themselves, that's been pretty easy. But when you're sharing teachers, it's very difficult because the teacher, they're on a rotating schedule. And for a teacher to leave and get to the next building on time, they're finding coverage. So we do that now with German teachers, example, and actually even with French. Uh, and sometimes even with Spanish, when we don't have a, a full schedule for somebody and we need a period in another building. So what they're constantly doing is that teacher is either getting late to class where they're traveling to, or they're having to leave their class early and they're finding coverage for the last five or ten minutes to get them a head start so they can get to the other school. And they didn't want to add to that. It's already been difficult enough to schedule. So they were the factors that led them to move away from implementing the exploratory program, or at least their recommendation for implementing the exploratory program. Would there be an opportunity to consider that as an administrative code curriculum? 
Um, they do a little bit of that in the elementary schools. There's not significant. Yes, I'm aware in the elementary school of that. I don't know if there would be an interest. I think teachers might have an interest because I think enough of our world language teachers have come out to mm -hmm. speak to the importance of offering kids whatever we can offer to kids. We did um, for several years, just like the elementary schools run, we did run the middle school um, program. The same um, through Bucks County Community College providing the uh, supports um, and we stopped it because of that. And really, the problem with the middle school was either it's the start time in the morning, these kids have to get there pretty early, you know, right. they're starting that program at 7 10 or 7 15, which is pretty early, and so many of them were involved in after school activities that after school didn't make sense. So, I think that's why it gradually came. But yeah, we can certainly uh, consider looking at that. I mean, in terms of preparing our kids for their futures, I would like to see much more significant investment put into world languages. I'd like to see the, what, how we can be creative to overcome some of those challenges because I think that that is something that would really serve our students. And I think, you know, if we probed, I think that there's support for that among the students. So we just have to figure out how to narrow the gap between what those challenges are to how we can meet those needs. So. I guess we'll have more conversation about that next month. And, and it's possible when we shift to middle schools, that not, they'll have a better sense of what that looks like when they're determining how many teams are in each middle school and what that will look like with enrollments. So it's possible that, that conversation can. You right, you're afforded more opportunities when you have more kids. Yeah, you get a different look when we're in that environment and not shifting between three schools. You know, traveling between three schools is almost. Impossible for a staff member, but if it bounce two and there are larger enrollments, uh, it, it, it may have a better chance of, you know. Right, of course, because I was thinking we, we did it before, so it's done, but I guess back then it wasn't on the rotating schedule. We, yeah, we were in junior high school. Right, right. correct. Excuse me, and to piggyback off of Kyle, uh, do we have language clubs in the middle school? Do we have any clubs after school besides sports and music? Mm -hmm. Are there humanities? There's a number of clubs that run there. Yeah. What about the world, uh, a world language club, to help? There, there would probably be interest. We we, we run them at the high schools. Right. With, uh, yeah. Right. I did that. Languages, but yeah. we not. I, I don't know if there's been a, a push either on the part of students or on the part of teachers who have requested that. Of the I'd have to ask the principals if that's ever come up. But the answer is yes. There's a number. Clubs usually run based on interest by students who bring it to teachers' attentions, and the teacher has an interest in doing it, approaches the principal, and that's how the club gets started. As long as the participation remains high enough, we continue to run the club. I mean, it could even be a thing where the high school clubs could be going to the middle schools to help facilitate that. I know when students were doing graduation projects, that frequently was one of the projects where they would get down and work with uh, elementary or middle school students. Yeah, I mean, I know my kids over the years had, there were a lot of things that brought them to the middle schools. It wasn't language, but I mean, there's there are opportunities. In there. So continuing on with our combined courses, you see uh, a list of art courses where we're combining the, um, the different levels, regular, academic level, accelerated level, um, to together to um, support students and, and give them the opportunities to continue to study um, the area of art that they're interested in. Um, and then uh, you see here family and consumer science uh, combined courses. And then we have some music courses that are combined. Um, Excuse me. Was that was that family consumer science class that was that the one that wasn't running for a bunch of years at North for a while? Is that the same? So now it's back. Yes, that's great. Only two years in the to South. The last two years. That's that's great. It offers a nice service to the community. Absolutely. So you see the different music courses that are combined. And I think when you look at, particularly when you look at music and art courses, they, there's a, a, you know, if you want to call it a niche of students that want to continue to study music and explore art. And 
we want to continue to provide them with that opportunity. So by combining courses, we can continue to allow students to, to explore and study in those areas that, that they want to study, um, which I think is, is important. Um, and it's great that we are able to do that and our teachers do that work to combine the courses together. Sure. Because I'm in, I'm, I'm in the symphonic orchestra class, and it doesn't seem like string orchestra and symphonic orchestra are completely combined this year. Last year they were the completely combined, or no, like it doesn't seem like there were any separation. But this year, the symphonic orchestra class has only two ninth grade students there. So that, I think it was because of scheduling issues that there. That's the only reason why they're in the class. But otherwise, there is a string or separate string orchestra class. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that it is combined this year, or well, not? It's not combined this year. And it changes from year to year depending on what the enrollment is. So some of these courses may not be combined next year because of number of students. Um, so again, here's technology education. Similarly, another another um, group of courses that you know there's a specific a niche of, of students who really are invested in some of those courses and want to continue to take them. We have an accelerated energy power. What is that? Go back. Accelerated energy power tech. My son took that. Well, oh, I didn't two know. years. Okay, I have <laughs> never seen that. Okay. And, and with all these courses, I think it's important to realize that we know. I mean, almost annually, some of these courses don't run in one high school or the other. And some do. So because we have a single program thing, but, but that's why it doesn't right. come out. So we know in north there are certain courses that just don't typically run in the same south, but because they run in the other building, we keep them in the program planning book. So it can be a little deceiving sometimes to see things listed under a school. We know it's not going to run, hasn't run traditionally, and other ones have. And sometimes they run on cycle, so it's not surprising that the course doesn't run this year, but we we'll see it, you know, um, enough students register and will run the following year. So some of these aren't surprises, but others are becoming, you know, historically uh, under enrolled and not running. They are the ones that we need to talk about, whether we keep offering them or we're just in the book. And then uh, we have here some more technology education and some um, special education courses and business courses that that are combined um, as well. So. Any further questions about the courses not running, the shuttle courses, or the combined courses? Was there a handout? No. No. Because I couldn't see the visual um, while I was driving on the shuttles and everything. What? That's good. That's you a good thing. Um, <laughs> but I can't. Um, um, this is posted. So. Not a good thing. Well, it, it's already, it is posted on board docs. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, in this um, in this meeting agenda on board docs. Okay, it wasn't when I looked for it earlier. I mean, I, when I looked for it, it wasn't there, but I guess it's there now. It was posted on Friday. Oh, okay. I must have just missed it because I think I looked on Friday. Okay. Thanks. No, because I'm pretty sure it was posted on Friday. <laughs> so. All right, thanks. All right. So we'll then move on to our our second um, presentation for the evening, which is our update of our links program. We just made it up also that many times. Hi, Wendy. Hi. This is a lot of going on this. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Great. So, the evening's going to class. Very good, John. Okay, thank you. Um, so good evening everyone. I have my latest supervisor panel this evening and I'm um, here to tell you about the status of the LINCS program at this particular uh, time and place. Um, I obviously my supervisor, uh, Mary Lovett, is my administrative assistant. She's very, very helpful to me in uh, organizing the program. Carol Boyle and Ward and Lisa Bush staff are the, the people who most of our community members and students know to be the links contacts of both students and parents. And then Monica McLaughlin at Chancellor Center is the person who deals primarily with the nonprofit agencies who are interested uh, in being a part of our program. To give you 
little bit of background on the program. It actually uh, began as a pilot in 1994. And I can say that specifically because I was part of the team of educators who researched the, um, the concept of service learning back then and actually developed the program. The, um, the reason why uh, we, we looked into it and really had to look into it was because PDE came out with the um, recommendation that schools implement service learning, but they left it to be a local decision as to whether or not it would be a graduation requirement. So there were many discussions in Council Rock uh, to determine which way we wanted to go, and in the end we decided that it would be a program um, that was one that we hope to instill the altruism of our students rather than to require them to do it and sort of knocks some more to us. So, so we recommended it highly as opposed to making it a requirement at the time. And of course the uh, first piece of it is that we intend to meet genuine community needs. And the second part of it was the service part of it. And, and that, I'm sorry, the uh, learning part of it where students uh, were hopefully enhancing their own personal development uh, in areas such as communication skills, problem solving, confidence, and self esteem. So it's interesting to me how the term has evolved because pretty much today we refer to it as community service. But back then it was most definitely service learning. And uh, somehow it is more into uh, community service kind of title. Um, how it works. The, the easiest way of, of finding a, an agency or organization to work for is to go to our website and to look for the directory of pre-approved organizations. And this directory um, specifically has uh, all of the contact people, in particular the supervisor who is the person qualified to be the one to oversee our students. And I'll tell you what qualified means in just a minute. The um, number on, on that directory is over 300. So right now, we have over 300 agencies that our students can peruse and, and actually uh, decide if they would like to work for. In addition to that, we have uh, another link on our website, which is entitled Upcoming Opportunities. These are calls and emails that we get on a regular basis, where um, an example would be a PTA president in one of our elementary schools is asking for assistance at an activity, or um, the organizer of a community uh, run is asking for assistance. So we will post them in two places. One will be the upcoming opportunities on the site, and the other will be on bulletin boards in our respective high um, schools. Is there a lot of that that comes in? Uh, you will, I'll show it to you in okay. a few minutes, but uh, right now we have about five that are listed. Um, the kicks off is either who's on there. I just wondered how we all know it, it is out in the community. It's well, the different it's, organizations that we it's that we all know. Yeah, okay. I would say it is. Okay. Um, so so that is, is the easiest way for a student to actually um, find an agency or organization that they'd like to work for. Now, if that doesn't always happen though, uh, students may look at the list where they may come to us with an idea to work in an agency that is not on our pre-approved list. And that's where it gets a little bit more complicated. And, and that has actually occurred since 2015 when the Child Protective Services Law came into effect. So, so what would happen is, is that the, the nonprofit agency must complete the checklist. And the person who must complete it is the supervisor of the students, the one who will be working, for the most part, face-to-face -face with our students. And that would include the Pennsylvania State Police Clearance, the Pennsylvania Clearance Statement, which is formerly the Child Abuse Clearance, the name has changed, the FBI uh, fingerprint clearance, if not a PA resident for the past 10 years, and if they have a PA resident, then they have to file an affidavit on the first school. And again, all that is available on the website. Um, the cost for the first two is, is the one boy, they are in charge. The third is $24.25. Um, and, and the key piece of this is that they have to be Pennsylvania, the first two have to be Pennsylvania clearances. 
We get into some trouble when people will come to us from New Jersey um, or other states or even international locations that our kids are doing service work in, and we're not able to approve them for the links program because they're not considering them. Uh, clearances and, and we check that and double check that if our legal counsel will be sure that that is entirely accurate and it is. But that is one problem that, that we sometimes have. Um, and those clearance that that those approvals are for five years? Yes. Now the, the interesting thing is though is that and, and I just had a conversation today with a parent about it that if we can't approve it for links it doesn't in any way diminish the work of the student and, and the, uh, the community service, the uh, benefit um, to the personal development of the student. And certainly we can uh, put it in our letters of recommendation that the counselor is writing. We can, uh, the students can put it on the resumes. So the, the activity is still a, a good activity for students, even though we can't approve it as a LACE activity. Uh, for technical reasons. So, so just, since I'm new to the high school now, and I've heard the same place right. conversation for the last couple of years now, people being frustrated since this law came into place. What's the downside? You know, because having said all that, it seems like they get credit uh, or, or people that they want to see, people that they would like to know their feelings for, and see it through these other pieces. What, I mean, what's the importance of the links hours themselves? What do they get? And why is it a pain point for them that some of that work can't be like um, because you're yeah, not going to deal with it's, it's, it's framed it up. Yeah, it's hard it's hard to really say specifically because our community is so bought into links yeah. that that they yeah, want links. Well it's also hours. required for certain clubs. NHS so, NHS um, well, all the honor societies. I mean, it's it depends. Some of them, some of them. Um, right. right. So I mean, that, that's 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 the what we're getting at. Yeah. What, what, what is links occurrence? That's the, really the only thing. Well, well okay. but, but for us, it's, it's also if they, if they want the hours to get them to move on the transcript. I don't get into that. Yeah, it has, it has to be on the transcript. And also, why I, they have a frustration point. And I think there's some scholarships and things that might be associated. Oh, okay. So if it's, yeah. not yeah. Yeah. Thing, yeah. it's not actually a documented and approved thing, they can't. That would have been a But still. So I mean, that's a small number of of people, but it's just it's not something that we're going to have to deal with. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
during the course of the past year, people may have questioned in one way or another. So I thought it would be good to examine those a little bit. Uh, the first is voluntary participation outside of the school day. And, um, and that would include if school is in session and they are absent. So they, they really can't be appointed late hours if they have to be absent on a day and we're in session. It would have to be beyond the school day. Uh, no payment for services, including tips. Um, some volunteer work that is completed as a member of a school organization may be approved if it's beyond the membership requirement. An example of that might be um, there, there will be four hours of tutoring required by NHS. So if students are really interested in the tutoring and they continue on in the evenings in our library, we would consider uh, the morning links hours, what is beyond the requirement of, of that organization. Um, frankly, right now, I'm doing sort of an analysis of what we are approving beyond the requirement of an organization, a school organization. So I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of if we're being consistent across the board in, in my school and also between North and South. Um, because that could account for the variation in the hours that one school is doing it one way and other school is doing it another way, and I don't really know. So I'm, I'm actually going through folders and kids that they can turn it in. Um, volunteer work to promote, promote a particular religion, politician, or political party would not be approved. And, and again, a specific example of that, just to give you um, an example of what that means is, a student may work in polls, checking people in. However, they may not stand in the polls handing out literature for a particular candidate. Uh, as far as religion goes, they may uh, work at a vacation Bible school, uh, supervising students, uh, children in the recreational area. But they may not teach a Bible lesson for Lynn's credit. So when you look at the list, you will see Many uh, churches, you'll see uh, various political organizations, but again, the differentiation is made uh, as to what they can approve those hours for. And, and there have been some questions about that, so we go back and check with our council to be sure that that is still in fact the case it is. Um, I'm sorry. The verification forms must be turned in annually on an assigned date. These dates are advertised um, in many places, including the Wix website, including the, um, the forms that the students fill out, including the daily announcements as the dates approach. Uh, it's mid-May for seniors because a lot of things have to be done as we, we tally the seniors, and you can hear about that in May. Uh, and it's the end of May for everyone else. Occasionally, we have people who will come to us in 11th grade or even 12th grade and say, these are all the hours that I've done throughout high school, and um, we will accept what is current. But we think that we will let it, that you know, when the year closes out, so does, does this, just the same as the first one. And incoming ninth graders submit up to five hours of volunteer service. Um, again, I'm currently looking into the consistency of this among the three schools. I've been in contact with the uh, supervisors in each one of the schools, and, and there's a little bit of inconsistency. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be meeting with them, and we're going to decide you know, which way we want to go. So, so does, does that say that they're only allowed to do Correct. Five? Yeah. They're allowed to submit. They're allowed to submit five. And, and what happens is, is that originally the thinking was that those five hours would be completed at the conclusion of the eighth grade year during the summer preceding ninth grade, because technically they were in ninth grade. So we thought if they wanted to get started, they could. Um, not all the schools well, are doing that. Years, okay. Not all the schools are doing that. Uh, some are doing it throughout the eighth grade year. Uh, I'm making sure that they, if they're going to outside agencies that everybody has clearances um, you know, in keeping with what we do in high school. But I'm going to meet with them um, in a couple of months to to grow that out and make sure we're all doing the same. Tangible benefits, um, in, in addition to the intangible ones. Although it's not a requirement for graduation, when 60 hours is reached, and we took that 60 hours because originally that's what the state had uh, suggested, uh, we documented on the transcript, 
We put a gold seal on the diploma. We recognize it in the graduation program. And uh, students are eligible for scholarships and awards. And to give you an example of that, uh, what we will do when we receive uh, the Bucks County Volunteer of the Year application, there will be committees in both high schools to select a candidate to recommend for that award. And in the last three years, two of our students have been Bucks County Volunteers of the Year, which they were pretty proud. Uh, yeah, there, there are other things. Um, the Bucks County Courier Times Citizen Scholars Award uh, will be uh, we will check the links hours. But we can also check whatever else they may have done too in um, recommending students. Uh, there is a credential um, National Association of Secondary School Principal Sphere of the Community Award that we're now looking at and we're looking at, at various students and deciding who to recommend uh, for, for those awards. Uh, also on our senior recognition night, many, many of the uh, scholarships and awards that the community um, offers are, are based on community service. So links becomes an integral part of that as well. And then lastly, college admissions recognize long-term commitment to a cause or organization. Um, and, and that's what we try to tell our students, that it's you know better to be involved in something that is your passion rather than to be jumping all over the place, doing an hour here, an hour there. Um, and, and that's important to colleges as well. So, so these are the benefits that, that we hope our students are taking. So of these benefits, if they're working, if they're doing the work but it's not recognized, it's just saying because it's a New Jersey, right. um, would there be any kind of documentation of that work on transcripts? No. no. So obviously the university would want to know the congratulations graduation program, you probably wouldn't recommend them for community awards because you wouldn't have a good document ever. Uh, the counselors know because many times counselors will be at the, uh, you know, the home of recommendations and uh, they know that they're things done. So, so indeed, for some of these things, even if they're not in these programs, so you can get recognized. Yes. And, and some do both. Some get enough of the hours, the 60 hours through links, but do a number of additional hours that may not qualify. They can be recognized to a uh, letter. So, you know, the intent for the students through the links program is to get the 60 hours that meet our requirements so they can get that component that is described up there. But a lot of them do well beyond 60 hours. One more thing about those people who are focused on things that aren't approved, but who want credit for, for that work that they do, it should, should be recognized for what, what they do. It sounds like they tend for a lot of things. Are you going to touch on the National Honor Society piece? Or, no. so, so, so I guess I'm guess just trying to get to the real pain yeah. point. Is the real pain point National Honor Society? Well, there are part of agencies that we don't approve across the clearances. Um, and it was, Problematic because it's so new, right. uh, and everybody had to submit at the same time, and they never had to do it before. But really, I, mean, I, I work with people and can generally find a solution uh, as to how we can get clearances from somebody who will be there for the kids. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think that that's still a major problem, but it does come up. Yeah, it, just, it just seemed to be such a pain point. Maybe a year ago, two years ago, yeah, where we yeah, heard a lot about yeah. it, and, and, and I haven't heard anything recently. Right. So I'm just curious, right. if, you know, we've either made any changes to the program or just working more smoothly now. Or... I just think the time has passed, and we have over 300 agencies that have complied. Um, I'm working with a parent, I think she's a staff parent, who um, she she works at um, Penn Medicine, and her child has done a, a summer program. Um, which sounds magnificent, uh, working in the operating room, working in you know, different, different locations. And um, she was having trouble you know, coming up through, through these different people because we don't have clearances for a person supervising students. So we were examining that uh, today for quite a while on the telephone. And there's, she works at Pennsylvania Hospital. There's a Penn Medicine person who is approved for clearances at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital at Hub. So we're going to research that because that was approved and this is something comparable that's happening at Pennsylvania Hospital 
and she's going to do research, you know, what, what the difference is, and then I'm going to do research on our. And, and that's a, a big point, too. <coughs> a lot of the decisions that we're making as we go along are collaborative decisions. Um, if I have a question, you know, I'm not afraid to go to Barry, so what do you think? Um, I'm going to call Christine um, Taylor tomorrow about, about this question. If none of us know what the answer is exactly, or we want to confirm something we think, um, we go to council. So, so we're trying to make the best decisions possible um, because, you know, it is important. What is, what is the reason that the religious and political things are deliberately excluded? You talked about the two outcomes. Yeah, we, we shared with, um, and this happened two years ago when, you know, we had a conversation about like some academic standards meeting and there was some question about, you know, why we can't approve some of these things that we don't. Uh, so we went to Rob and he just said that the way we define um, these fits better with not connecting religious and political activity to a school system that um, if it looks like it's an endorsement because these are because it's a formal school district program just like clearances you know if something were to happen you know it's off our school grounds it's off our school time because we're recognizing the program we have it's an extension of what we can do in the school. And those are the things that we wouldn't do in the school. Um, everybody in the school that works with children has to have clearances. Everybody works with students in the school setting, doesn't get involved in uh, specific political and or religious things. So that's just an extension of what we do. So we have to provide that same kind of environment and setting for the students when they're participating for us to recognize it as part of our formal program. So, you know, when we spoke with Mr. Cox about that, about all of these areas as they came up and we were reviewing whether we should be making any changes, he suggested that we were safest to keep it as we, uh, we currently were uh, and how we had it defined. And we shared with him our specific language. We said, this is what we define for our programs. And he just said he was much more comfortable um, with those remaining as they currently were. So, so a lot of this for me, um, trying to identify what the issues have been, um, analyzing it, making sure that um, the decisions that have been made are decisions that we want to continue, which is an example of why we talked to Rob about that, because we asked the same question that you did. You know, why why would that be? And, and that was the response that we've gotten. But the most time that I have spent this year has been on uh, dating websites. And, um, there are many changes that I've made, and it's, I think, you know, always a work in progress, but I tried to get it in as good a shape as I possibly could, with great assistance from Mary Novick, um, my assistant, and also Jen Stratch, our webmaster. So um, I, I want to just tell you what I tried to do, and then we'll actually take a look at it. So the, the first thing is um, one site for both high schools. It seemed that we, before this occurred, if you went on the South Link website, it was one site, if you went on yours, it was a different site. So there were, there were different people who were going in and, and making changes to religions, and it wasn't linked, it wasn't carried over. So we have it was also a district site that was uh, kind of a third site that we were seeing. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, so we have one person who actually goes in uh, on a regular basis, and that is Mary Rogan, uh, my assistant, and she will make any changes that occur. As Jen Stretch was the one who had completely helped us revamp it, so, um, you know, so she's going in as well, so it's limited to that. So when you press, click on either link, you will see the same site, and it will be a Council Rock School District link site. So that, I think, is a good improvement. I'm hoping uh, to do a slideshow illustrating students at work I don't have any pictures yet. It was, you know, just um, an idea that we've had. So I'll be trying to collect them to make it a little bit more attractive. Uh, the biggest thing is that um, I've streamlined it dramatically and attempted to make it user friendly. I'm not a website designer at all. I know nothing about websites, but I hope I know how to write and how to be logical and how to be a consumer. So that's what I was basing it on. Um, and, and so you said we organized it, and I tried to take out any inconsistencies and most of the redundancies. But I have to say that, in fairness, 
a lot of the redundancy started occurring because of the change in the law. So everywhere you looked, uh, there was something about the clearances. And um, now that we are two or three years down the line, and, and it isn't nearly the issue I think that, that it has been, I think uh, there's, it's not as necessary. But, but there are still uh, various places that I can do it. So, so you can see, uh, I, have, I have links on the left hand side. XIAS, LINCS. I tried to take away the periods, and that was the debate in my mind because it stands for Learning and Neighborhood Community Service. So I guess technically, as an English teacher, I like the periods there, but it was all different ways everywhere, and it just made sense to leave them out. So, um, so that's the first page, and that's where I hope to have the uh, slideshow of pictures at some point. But I tried to you know, have a, just a general paragraph at the top that explains it in a uh, coherent manner, and then the announcements uh, that, that will always be there. Okay. You, can do, you can just start down with, start, yeah, start with, um, yes. The guidelines include uh, much of what you've already seen, uh, but I think are the most important ones, and then a whole lot of other guidelines that um, I felt needed to be included. But I probably took out as many as you see um, that I felt were, I merged some and I felt they were being redundant. Uh, the directions for students, this will take students step by step into exactly what they have to do in order to uh, obtain rank salaries. And it's very, very specific, and it's all part of the slides that you saw how it works. The links to the forms, again, have separate, separate uh, links for those, uh, the pre-approval form and the verification form. If you want to just flash on this quickly. There, yeah, that's there. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, there were changes made on these as well to make them um, a little bit easier to understand. Here's the question. So, so what do you see? And again, this would be we organize this because for some reason supervisors email us first. And so you couldn't really find an agency very easily if you were looking for one. So it was easy enough to just um, alphabetize the um, the agency. So everything is in alphabetical order. And the key is that it is the supervisor whose clearances we have that the student needs to work with. And sometimes you'll see the same agency a number of, of different times, and it's because it might be in different locations. Um, you know, there might be an office in um, Chafon, there might be an office in Levittown, and our kids work at either ward. So, um, so that's you know, that is this way. There are over 300 on that list. Uh, one before that, Oops, yeah, sorry. Uh, that's, that's okay. uh, funding opportunities. This is the list of uh, you have asked about. Do you have a lot of these? This is what we have so far in this committee this year. So just to give you an idea. And if they would like us to put something on our website, we actually give them a template to fill out asking them for specific information. So this way, uh, each one of the entries has the same information available to the community or to the student to say. And then the uh, pre approval process for the nonprofit organization. Again, yeah, that's separated out as well. We have Christine Taylor's letter uh, that she has recently updated, explaining exactly what needs to happen and why. Uh, we have the um, supervisor checklist, which talks, which speaks to the, um, the clearances that are needed. And then, of course, we indicate that they need to also provide information on two other forms that are submitted to them by the student. And then... Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Then, yeah, that's fine. And then go to the next slide. No, One more slide. Yeah. 
Sorry. Bye. <laughs> so um, next steps, increased communication. Um, I, you know, I, I, I was, I'm asking Sal and we're doing it as well, talking about it, orientations. You know, just getting the word out there would be better than we have. Uh, newsletters, or a counselor newsletter that, that they talk about it in. Um, list of messages, reminders. Uh, make sure everybody really knows about the, the dates, the due dates. Sometimes that becomes a problem. So, um, so I'm just trying to keep the communication going. And then the big thing that we're working on, and I haven't quite solved this, is it would be really nice if the uh, student or parent could actually look on uh, one of our sites and see how many hours the student has, rather than coming in and checking the status with our secretaries. Uh, or uh, you know, having having the hours posted, or having the hours mailed to them when they agree sixty. So um, is that something that can be done on hack? Yeah, I, I yeah it, we can. Not, a system that, not even like a note or anything. So we're looking at Naviance. We're looking at Naviance. Oh. Yeah. Well, that. that's one way to get them onto Naviance, isn't it? Right. <laughs> So um, we haven't solved that problem entirely yet, but but it's definitely one that we want to do. And I already mentioned the inconsistencies that I think possibly may be present uh, with how we're looking at the school organizations and, and you know what we're assigning extra hours to, and also the middle schools. So so they're they're my jobs. And then um, uh, lace totals. I thought it would be nice to show you exactly how successful the program is. Um, you know, these are amazing totals that our students have um, completed in one year. And um, you know, I think we are fulfilling our mission of service to the community as well as hopefully personal development um, of students as well. I know frequently in my role as principal, I'm asked to identify one thing, and this is for you, Margaret, because you asked me this question this week, um, one thing that um, best characterizes our students when I think of our schools. And, and I always say altruism. And altruism is a, a foundational part of, of who our students are. And uh, all the fundraising that goes on, all the links hours that are achieved outside of the school, are just amazing. And, uh, so I think this shows that the Lens program is really successful. So I don't know if this is a question or a statement, but certainly something best along with Dr. Frazier. This is, this is fantastic. Um, i, I got to believe that there's A, some, some help that we get from a website standpoint, communication standpoint with uh, Susie Kamran. Um, so so not, just, that that yeah, yeah, not just, yeah, not just, uh, you know, a communication with students and families, but also out to the communities around not only what we're doing, but more importantly, what we could be doing or find out what we shouldn't be doing. So I think that's probably an exciting opportunity. We've always talked about how stretched we've been from a capacity standpoint to do the things that we want to do. So this kind of feels like an area that that, that role can potentially help with once we get settled with all the other things that you have to deal with. Yeah, I didn't think I should grab a first thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I, 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 I expect she'll grab on the links when she sees it. It's, it's a wonderful story. Yeah. And this should be something else. This translates into the scorecard. Yeah. 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 And do we have any Google Sheets or anything like that? Yeah. 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 I don't think we have to work that hard to convince our kids to do this. I think it's really just, I mean, I, it's interesting because sometimes when you're talking to parents of younger students, they're surprised that it's not a requirement. Like they don't, you know, because they hear about it all the time, they know older kids in their neighborhoods are, you know, are doing it. So they they just think that it's naturally a requirement. Are we tracking consistently up over time? I do have a history. Yeah. And it's going this way. Um, well, you know, no exchange in schools, so it's a little erratic. There's no drop. Well, we can see that that's not what we're tracking, yeah. which I think is an important part of how we grade our, our overall performance. Mm -hmm. 
And that's why complement switch will be for the same. And they have a lot of work that's done to try to make this user friendly, try to you know, find what, what was causing confusion for students or parents. Uh, being a contact person for a lot of the questions that come up, as she said, you know, when someone's trying to find an activity that doesn't fit cleanly into this, she's been you know, on the phone meeting with people working with, with families to try to find a way to make it work if we can. So uh, she's done a great job in the years. She's uh, taking this over and just taking this, uh, you know, leaps and downs beyond where we were and done a great job. Awesome. Thank you. Right website contest by now. Right website contest by now. Right. Sounds like a great policy, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just see a logical line. Yeah. You know, you have to know, you know, what. Right. That's great. And labor consistency. Yeah. One of the things yeah. that I always see across our yeah. schools is an opportunity to do it consistently and make the best one across the That's great. Do we have any questions or comments from the community? I have a question back to the uh, course schedule. So, uh, can you identify who you are, please? Sorry, George Moyer, you can. Uh, last year, we encountered for the first time with the world is some of the struggles in the high school with scheduling around uh, trying to take a number of classes and maintain extracurriculars such as band activity and languages, um, things like that. We the, the current class schedule doesn't facilitate people, uh, particularly higher achieving students, necessarily take advantage of some of the great opportunities that were listed as classes up there. So when I think what Mr. Desco said that there's challenges with the middle school schedule as well and enabling kids to take more classes, given the fact that we are consolidating to two middle schools this year as well as redistricting, is there an opportunity to do sort of a whole scale review of the scheduling that could perhaps enable a reduction in the number of merged and missed classes and shuttle classes, um, as well as giving kids the middle school opportunities. Because I know one of the things when we were looking at a shuttle class, kids that shuttle from one school to the other lose 10 minutes, you know, initially leaving their school for a period, they have to leave one class 10 minutes early, and they get back to the next class 10 minutes late. And that's obviously a negative impact on their academic and if they're in AP and honors classes, particularly those 10 minutes a day add up pretty negatively. So I don't know if that's something that's in consideration. I know nothing about classroom scheduling, um, but I'd be curious if there's some consideration to look at that. So we wrestle with schedules all the time. You know, we talk about whether or not a six period a day is a benefit or a hindrance to what we do. And like everything, there's give and take in all aspects of our programs. So one of the advantages of having six periods is our students get 55 minutes of class, which is a significant amount of time compared to what a lot of other schools provide in a particular subject area. The downside is it's very limited. Our students get less opportunities for four courses. You know, most high schools have seven or eight period days, and, and we don't. But their class periods run about 45 minutes. So, um, you know, we wrestle with that. We're wrestling with finding time as we're going down the path of PLCs. You know how we find time in the school day um, to uh, implement that program. Uh, we are working and wrestling with the advantages and disadvantages of virtual courses, how we can structure those, how they might benefit kids. Um, but yet, if we have too many students, finding out where we can place them and how to supervise them. Um, so there's a lot of conversation. Uh, obviously, education is evolving quickly. A lot of changes and. We're trying to become more consumer friendly with some things. Um, we've done things like opened up opportunities for a, um, a number of credits that students in the high school can take outside of Council Rock so they can open up their schedules and maybe take courses that they would like to take that they could typically fit by fulfilling a requirement outside of, uh, of Council Rock. And so there's some guidelines that, so that, that's relatively new, we probably really built that and defined that within the last five or six years. Uh, so the answer is yes. The, the, the question is an easy one. The solution has been you know, difficult. 
if, if I can, just because I've seen the, some of the downsides, what are the upsides in the long period? Like, is, is, do you see better results in the longer periods and AP exams, things like that? So, Susan, you're a pretty big proponent of 55 minutes, right? So, why don't you want to answer that? Well, uh, we have we have amazing AP results. Um, I, I just in fact was telling parents today that in, in my school, 37 percent of our students receive fives. Um, on, on. So, we're not seeing that that it's an issue. Uh, and then on the negative side, we're, we're right. seeing a lot of positives. But um, when you calculate the the 55 minutes compared to many schools that have 45 minutes, 40 minutes, um, it's pretty bit, It's almost like having like an extra marking period of instructional time in that face-to-face, -face, um, you know, contact uh, or the virtual contact, which um, we're we're in the throes of developing and experiencing, and, and that's a lot of time in poor courses. Um, so. So yeah, like we, I feel particularly committed to the, the longer periods. There are also like a lot of staffing implications um, that that may not be um, appropriate, you know, financially for a district. And, and looking at some of the others, when you start with the 55-minute period, uh, the reason why the alternate day courses have become so popular is that's how the students are able to take those electives that are so intriguing to them. And, and even in 10th grade, where they don't have to take phys ed, it's another opportunity for them to fit a course in. So, so we're doing the best we can with the schedule that we have, but there may be changes on the horizon for sure. We think about our numbers scaling um, with the kinds of things that uh, Barry has just talked about. The virtual is, is really something that we're committed to. We feel it, it prepares students, makes them college ready, and um, you know, that's a whole other aspect that we talk about you know, implementing the best way possible. In addition to finding time for PLCs, um, it's, it's a complicated thing, but, but 55 minutes is, is good in our four courses. Thank you. Yeah. And, and to be, I mean, this is just like a little fun fact, but um, 55 minute periods have been in our school district for, I would say, about 45 years. I don't know if that's good or bad. It's just the way it is. <laughs> well, I can vouch as a, as a teacher that 45 minutes is not enough. You don't get to do your pre-class and, uh, you know, not anyway. I want to go on to the virtual. Uh, how long have you been working on that? Because I, I think that a teacher could Skype a class. She could see her students. He could see his students, and they could see the teacher. I, classroom management would still work. And uh, there are courses that, um, that I can take at, at Penn. Uh, I can audit them now. And, you know, there's the, the professors in Tokyo. <laughs> you know, it, it's, a, in a, it's the world that the kids are going to go into. And it's much less dry than a, an online course, which is just you don't hear intonation of voice and, you know, body language. Um, I think that that should be fairly easy to implement. I don't know how Matt feels about that, but uh, I don't see why we couldn't do that. We, um, we have tried to do uh, parallel classes at the same time at separate locations. What happens is, is because these are still high school students and not adults, um, we're still required to have an adult in the classroom with them. It usually ends up being a teacher. So if you're paying to have a teacher in the classroom, why not just teach the class? Teach? So that's what we've 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 tried this how many times? Two or three times every couple of years we try it and it just it just doesn't work. It I do want to separate oh. the conversation, but we are because we are running virtual courses that students take online through our teachers. We have about two hundred students this year in a virtual course. Now it's, it's a virtual course that we also offer face to face. But one of the things that we've experienced, and we've, we've talked about this for the, for the longest time, some students take it because they find the benefit. They can either run school late because that will be their first period class that they can take virtually and they can do it at their time. Others take it so they can get out at the end of the day if it fits in their schedule. And those that don't take it in the middle of the day and, and go to the library, but they don't necessarily have to work on 
the virtual course, they can work on other work that may be more pressing at the time because they can do virtual work anytime. But when we talked to some of the students, because we were surprised, we thought this was going to go through them quickly. And it's taken us a couple of years, we've been doing it for four years now, I think. Um, a lot of the students are just very clear. They said, I prefer to be in class with my teacher. I, you know, so it's, it's not that the virtual course isn't a quality course. That their answer was, I just like being in the classroom in a regular school day with my teacher. So that's why they weren't signing up for it. So we don't require students to take it. Could we talk about that? Should every student in high school be required to take at least one virtual course because it is a way to the future? They're likely to encounter that in college. Uh, they are certainly will um, you know, encounter that in a work environment, taking an online kind of a program. So we're still looking at it, wrestling with it, looking at the, um, the platform that we will use. We spend a lot of time, you know, we're using Canvas right now as the uh, LMS the learning management system for that. Um, so we're spending more time and we're also looking at what kind of courses we may be able to get virtually that we can't teach ourselves. And then when you say virtual, you mean as, as an online class as one would take at a university. But I, I think the live time, I think the students would engage in an appreciated class where the teacher was on the, the blackboard and the students were in their desks. Well, I, I there, there are um, a lot of our teachers who are actually teaching students uh, visually as part of the online course. Like they'll come in and teach a okay. lesson. So they give a online. lecture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. But then the students don't get to interact with the teacher in lifetime. That's where the real dynamic is important because we we learn from our classmates. And the teacher the teacher, you know, being in, be able to interact with all of them at the same time. And to see the faces like if the teacher's talking about some uh, tradition somewhere in another part of the world and one of the students is like you know, in lifetime, she's going to be able to say, oh, so-and-so, you don't understand that, you know, or I see that you're making a face. You can't do that with the, just the right. course on Blackboard. So there's a lot of lifetime conversation going on <coughs> during the school day because the teachers are still there in, in school working with their virtual classes. But you're right, there is a downside as well. Yeah, I just think it could be better. And I think maybe a librarian could be the adult in the, in the room. It could, it could work. Well, and that, I mean, a lot of our students that take virtual courses now, that's where they go. They go to the library. So they're in the library, and the librarian is, is the adult in the room. But they're, you know, in a library environment where it's a, a space where lots of kids are. So right. you have to think about the, the environment, the context where having a, a live session with someone you know, Skyping in or video or whatever, while there are lots of other kids milling around the library might not be the most ideal situation. No, it would have to be in a room within the Yeah, library. absolutely. But um, those it, 200 kids, how many classes is that being taught virtually? Mm -hmm. We could do that. Grade, a lot of 12th yeah. grade, yeah. a lot of English, English 12, accelerated English 12, um, mythology. And psychology, psychology, yeah. accelerated psychology, yeah. psychology yeah. that the 11th as well. Um, yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 so yeah. so yeah. 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 Right, are right. Accelerated in math. Take you know, some you take that virtually. We, um, a little committee of us, went out and visited some other Bucks County schools to see how they're approaching it. And uh, I think it was Palisades talked about. Um, he talked about meeting virtual, meeting face to face, like two times a week, uh, and then virtually three times a week. So they they were in some of their classes intending to sort of have it all. Like a yeah. hybrid. Yeah, a hybrid. Right. Yeah, I think that that's even better than strictly online. We, we talked about that with some of our teachers. They wanted to try that. But then the students that don't have the flexibility of having it anywhere, they have a hole in their schedule. They have to have it at a certain time, and then that limits you know, yeah. the, the flexibility. And, so. and some districts that do that model where they have so many days of virtual time versus days of face-to-face -face time, a lot of times that is done so that they can create space in a schedule. For example, if they have the 45-minute class period, 
have a lab science, you need more than 45 minutes for the lab. So they build that lab science into a double period. Well, now for the, of the week or the cycle, whatever, however their schedule runs, they have this lab period that the other days of that week, they don't have a course. So by layering in perhaps a virtual course, kids can take, you know, oh, I have face-to-face -face three days, two days virtual. Well, one of those two days that's virtual, I'm actually taking my lab or some of the other courses that might be partial credits, sometimes health and phys ed courses or things, they can kind of map those in. So some of the districts that do that kind of a model do it for the same reason of trying to trying to fit Get things more. into a schedule where we only have this many periods and our kids need these classes, so here we'll give them this option. Well, it would be interesting to get the cost of transporting the children back and forth to the schools um, and then figuring with that, the cost of that, and then the t amount of time they're losing from the classroom in going back and forth, and then trying to figure out the cost of getting a, a person to help be in the room with the children while the course is going on live time. Is that, is that positive? You know, frankly, it's not, shuttling is not the answer. Uh, it's our way of saying that we're doing what we can rather than not offering the course at a school. But it's not the answer because a lot of kids who originally signed up for the course wind up dropping the course because they don't want to shuttle. Right. And, um, so we're not really doing what we should be doing, mm -hmm. but it's better than not offering the course at all in public schools. Anyone else? Yeah. I, the reason I have two things. One, I Did guess. Did you say the name, please? Uh, Bobby from Rich Rollin. Thank you. I'm one of those parents, uh, Mr. McCarthy, who had the big question about the I know. Right. I know. And, uh, yeah. That's why when you come, I saw it was on the agenda about the links, and I really appreciate what you're doing and the questions. Like you said, the communication is a big key. Because I, like I said, I had a situation with my daughter who had questions about her links hours. Realizing, of course, some of it was her issue. She didn't end in her hours on time. Now, the question that I had in reference to that was the program that she was involved in wasn't over in May. So she waited, you know, she waited until after May, of course, didn't get credited for anything that was done before May because she was late and she just got credited for everything from May on. However, that's, you know, that's her problem as well. But like you said, I now understand how it works. I really appreciate the fact that you have the list in. And if you don't, if you're not on an approved list now, that you can get it from her. Because that was the other question that I had. My daughter did a lot of things for an organization, and I well mentioned the organization, but in order to get credit for the links hours, you had to be a member of the like the executive committee. You couldn't be just one of the people there that were working at some of the events, and all. And it actually discouraged her from going to some of the events for links hours. She went just because, you now she she wanted to do it. But uh, like I said, this was really. Uh, and enlightening thing, and, and I think it is good if you can get it out there and have it all there. I thought it was uh, really well done, and hopefully, as the kids are coming into ninth grade, they're made aware of it as opposed to when they're a junior now, realizing that they need hours for whatever reason. I mean, I'm not really sure if I agree with needing the links hours to be a part of the National Honor Society. I think there's other methods that maybe can show your diversity and what you. Well, I'm going to look into that too. You know, like, like extracurricular activities, not necessarily links, but that's, you know, a question for another day. And my other question may not even be appropriate for today. Uh, it's just something that actually came up, but it wasn't the reason for my coming here. I found out about it about an hour beforehand. It was about one of the particular classes in South uh, today that was brought to my attention, a uh, health class, I believe where a slide was presented where they talk about uh, different religions. And one of the religions, and like I said, stop me if I'm going too far, we can bring this up at a general meeting on the school board. Uh, one of the religions that they talked about was gay rights, which is not a religion, it's a lifestyle. But it was presented as a religion, which actually is a disservice to all the religions that were there. 
And I don't know if that's something that's being taught across the school. Now, this was an incident in South. I don't know if it's being taught at North. I don't know if it was an individual teacher who just uh, decided to do this on their own and made a mistake, much like saying George Washington was the second president of the United States as opposed to the first. But it is concerning if this is something that is part of our curriculum that is being taught in the schools. Uh, I don't know if it's, like I said, it's, it's a bigger concern if it's part of the curriculum, if it's a, if it's a mistake that a teacher made, and the, I don't know if the materials that they use are being used throughout the district. And, and like I said, I'm not even sure of what health class it was in. If it's the class in human sexuality or something, I could maybe understand its inclusion in the class, whether it's a regular health or a class I'm not sure where it even belongs in that class. If we talk to you privately, can you give us more details so we can narrow down what we're looking for in terms of, I mean, can you tell us? Sure, and I'm sure, like I said, this is brand I'm sure you're going to hear more about it in the hours and the comments, et cetera, may not be appropriate for this set. I right, will talk. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you all, meeting adjourned. Are you going to say something? Oh, I just, I looked on the National Honor Society website and it seems like good.